Hi, and welcome to the Brookdale Writers Series. My name is Suzanne Parker, and I'm part of the English faculty here at Brookdale, as well as the director of the Visiting Writers Series. Today I'm talking with Jenna Blum, the author of Those Who Save Us, which is climbing, or actually probably, I should say, vaulting up the New York Times and Boston Globe bestseller lists. Um, Jenna has been writing professionally since she was 16 mm -hmm. years old when you won a, f a fiction contest in Seventeen Magazine. Correct. And um, she has been published widely ever since. So welcome <laughs> to the show, Jenna. Thank you. Thanks, Suzanne. Published at 16. Wow, you couldn't just like eat popcorn and talk about boys? I, I did a lot of that. That was pretty much all I did except for write. I actually, I shouldn't say this on the air, but I had terrible grades as a student except in my English classes because mm -hmm. all I ever wanted to do was write. So um, I made it through the rest of my education by the skin of my teeth and, and ah. uh, probably I think based on the almost fluke of that early writing award. Mm -hmm. um, but I always wanted to be a writer ever since I was a little kid. You knew that. You always did. I always, it's the only thing I've ever been good at besides talking about writing and <laughs> like holding up the food service industry, which I did for a long time <laughs> while I was um, writing short stories and early drafts of, of this novel and mm -hmm. other novels. Um, right. My dad was a writer. He was a news writer for mm -hmm. CBS and NBC and ABC when they were in their heyday. Mm -hmm. um, and he wrote for Cronkite and Harry Reisner and Dan Rather. So my earliest wow. memories have the soundtrack of his typewriter, and I think that was a profound influence on my wanting to be a writer. Too. <laughs> wow. Well, I know that Those Who Save Us, the critical response has just been wonderful to this book. And it's a great book. It's Thank a you. great book. Um, I think it's been called a, you know, a poised and hair-raising debut. <laughs> Um, I love it when people memorize that. Thank you, Suzanne. <laughs> <laughs> it's on our poster, too, actually. Um, can you maybe tell us a little bit about it, what the book's about? Sure. Um, when I first started to give this spiel, I would freeze like a, a deer in the headlights. So I'll see how well I do with the Reader's Digest condensed version of the book. Um, Those Who Save Us is about a German woman named Anna, who mm -hmm. during World War II lives in Weimar, Germany, which is about five kilometers from concentration camp Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. From Buchenwald, you can see Weimar. From Weimar, you can see Buchenwald. Mm -hmm. um, Anna is basically a young woman who falls in love with the wrong guy at the wrong time, which I think is something that many people can mm -hmm. relate to. As yeah. a headstrong young woman, she falls in love with a Jewish doctor in her hometown. Uh -huh. Um, she gets pregnant by the doctor. She's hiding him in her father's house. Her father is a Nazi sympathizer and sycophant. And he um, finds the doctor and sends him up to the camp. And so Anna gets drawn into yeah. the resistance network in Weimar, um, trying to save her lover. Um, so she gets drawn into being a hero almost despite herself. Hmm. Um, she spends the remainder of a war in um, a bakery owned by another resistance mm -hmm. member and through her activities she becomes noticed by one of the high-ranking officers at the camp, the, the SS Obersturmfuhrer, whom mm -hmm. around my house is called the Big O because his name is so hard to pronounce. <laughs> um, and she forms a liaison with him to protect herself and her mm -hmm. little daughter. The daughter, Trudy, 50 years later, um, once Anna and Trudy have emigrated to Minnesota, is mm -hmm. always following her then elderly mother around asking, what did you do during the war? What did you yeah. do during the war? And Anna refuses to speak of it. So Trudy um, forms a project to interview Germans about uh, mm -hmm. their reactions to the war, war-era Germans. Mm -hmm. And in that way, she discovers the truth that her mother's kept <laughs> buried for over 50 years. <laughs> and memorized my own line. <laughs> Um, but that's pretty much what the book is about in a nutshell. Yeah. Yeah. That, this, that was very well done. Thank you. Got you. It down. I have, you got I've it had down. a little more practice since the book came out, fortunately. Um, well, I mean, it's great. I love the way that um, the book flashes back, you know, from the past back to the present. Um, you know, there are a lot of dualities in the book in a way. I mean, you're really looking at, um, you know, shame and guilt and what people knew and, you know, how you, how you move on beyond that. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, you know, with, I mean, there's a huge literature of the Holocaust and the war out there. Um, you know, what drew you to this subject to write this book? Oh, gosh. Uh, I always felt a profound connection to the Holocaust ever mm -hmm. since I was a little girl, which is strange considering I'm not the child of survivors. I'm not the grandchild of survivors. Mm -hmm. But when I was about four, I read at an obnoxiously precocious age, mm -hmm. I read a book called When Hitler Stole Pink Rabbit about the experiences of a German-Jewish refugee child, which mm -hmm. then prompted me to ask my Jewish father 
why were the Nazis and the Gestapo so mean to the Jews? And once he mm -hmm. figured out that I was talking about the Nazis and the Gestapo, he tried to give me an answer, but he couldn't give me yeah. any answer that would satisfy me on an emotional level. He also knew that yeah. two of his great aunts had died at Babayar, the Nazi killing pits, but he didn't know anything about them. He didn't yeah. know their histories. Um, and I think when history is lost, imagination steps in. So yeah. for the next two or so decades, I was haunted by um, putting myself in the position of this German Jewish child mm -hmm. um, and in the same position that Anne Frank would have been in who would have saved me and so on. Mm -hmm. um, the flip side of the coin is that my mom is part German and hmm. when I was right out of college she took me to Germany with her to see where her side of the family had come from. Both my parents were born in America uh -huh. um, but even still she wanted to, to investigate her own heritage and while in Germany, I was very discombobulated by the fact that I felt very at home there, which is mm. not a great thing to feel if you're half Jewish. Mm. And I kept saying to my mother, how could this have happened here? My mom was a concert pianist. She had studied mm -hmm. Brahms, Beethoven, and Bach, and both of us were trying to puzzle out how this uber-cultured country could have also engineered history's most atrocious mass genocide. So mm -hmm. basically we zoomed around the country um, on the autobahns drinking little bottles of schnapps and asking each other this question, mm -hmm. how could this have happened? And one day while driving from Buchenwald to Weimar, I asked her a slightly different question, which is, what would you have done mm. as a German woman living here during the war? Um, as a half-Jewish girl, I would have been sent with my dad to the camps, but my mom would have been put in the same position as my German heroine. She yeah. would have had to make some very difficult decisions whether to help her neighbors or concentrate on feeding and saving her child. So that was really where the inspiration for the book came from, wow. that first trip to Germany. Yeah. And then I felt that I could not write about a German protagonist without including some of the stories of the Jewish victims. So I endeavored uh -huh. to do that as well. Yeah, and very successfully, too. Thank you. Yeah. Now, I remember when I was reading um, your biography that um, you also worked for Spielberg, is that right? The Spielberg yes, Foundation? Yes, I did. When I was living in Minnesota for five years in the 90s, mm -hmm. um, again, buttressing the food service industry there. <laughs> and um, so I was kind of waitress by day, writer by night. Um, I also had a third hat, which was interviewing Holocaust survivors for the Steven Spielberg Survivors of the Shoah Foundation. Mm -hmm. Um, which was created in answer to revisionists, mm -hmm. which I think is far too polite a term for people who claim the Holocaust never happened, Holocaust deniers. Yeah. Spielberg's intent was to capture the testimony of Holocaust survivors on tape before they passed away so that we would have concrete evidence from people yeah. who were there that this had happened. Um, I was really young then. I was mm -hmm. in my early 20s and was supposed to have a lot of energy. So the foundation put me to work interviewing couples, survivors yeah. who had met each other overseas during the war, um, in displaced persons camps after the war, or in this country. Uh -huh. And so I interviewed perhaps 60 survivors over wow. that, that span of years. And one of the things that struck me, two things, first of all was how amazingly generous these people were in welcoming, welcoming me, a total stranger, yeah. into their homes um, and opening the labyrinth of some of the worst memories they had. Mm. The other thing that struck me was that many survivors had never spoken of their experiences until the interviews, not to their children, grandchildren, or spouses, even wow. though many of the spouses were also survivors. So it made me think a lot about what trauma does to people and ways people deal with trauma, and one of those ways is to zip the past um, wow. into an airtight compartment and shut it away. I, can, I actually can only imagine how emotional these experiences must have been. I mean, if this is the first time that people are telling some of these stories, I would think that'd be really hard. Actually. It was, I can't only imagine, I mean, the courage that the survivors demonstrated yeah. was unparalleled. Every single survivor, just to, even if survivors were professional speakers mm -hmm. about their experiences, and some were, some were going around in the Minnesota school system trying to educate people mm -hmm. about the Holocaust. Some were speaking in their local synagogues and um, also in churches in a mm -hmm. sort of effort to bridge communities. Yeah. Um, but even still, just uh, dredging up those memories um, was so, must have been so difficult. I mean, we were trained as interviewers not yeah. to presume that we knew how difficult it was. Mm. Part of our job, in addition to preserving history, 
was to act as a sort of safe guide for the survivor through this minefield of emotion. Mm. And um, so we had received very, very thorough training from the foundation beforehand, mm. um, how to read people's body language, how to, how to see when people were getting to a part in their story that was too painful for them to talk about, mm -hmm. when to press and when to withdraw. My very yeah. first survivor, I sat her down, we were sitting across from each other as you and I are, and we always started with very factual questions mm -hmm. so as not to totally freak the survivor out. And we had had a pre-interview beforehand so the survivor mm -hmm. would know what was going to happen and what would be asked. Mm -hmm. Even still, I said, what is your name and how did you spell it at birth? And she burst into tears. And oh, <laughs> I was God. like a 23-year-old <laughs> interviewing neophyte and I was terrified, but luckily the foundation was so sensitive both to mm -hmm. its survivors and its interviewers that they had trained me as to what to do in that situation. Wow, and that's great. Yeah, so it was very emotional for everybody. Now in the book, Trudy is, is interviewing as well. Right. Were you already working on the book? at this point when you were doing these interviews? When I started the show at interviewing, I had written an embryonic draft of Those Who Save Us mm -hmm. that if you placed it side by side with the draft, the, the draft, the book as it <laughs> appears now, uh, it would be almost unrecognizable. It was half about a German woman going through the war mm -hmm. and half about a 23-year-old woman driving through Germany with her crazy mother drinking schnapps and asking <laughs> how could this have happened here. Um, when I got home from that initial trip in Germany and wrote the draft of the book, I realized that it was a very drafty draft indeed mm -hmm. and that I didn't really know what I was talking about. So I embarked on what would become a decade's worth of research, mm -hmm. reading everything I could find about the experiences of Jewish survivors, about the makeup of the German people, mm -hmm. um, listening to music, um, trying to learn German, at which I was a failure. Oh, so and do you, sp you don't speak German? Ein bisschen, which means a little. <laughs> and when I tried to speak it in Germany, people would speak English back to me. <laughs> don't you um, love that? <laughs> yeah, it was great. It was not as bad as the French, but even still. <laughs> um, and I baked everything that appears in the novel so that mm. I would know what my baker, um, on a character would feel like from inside out. Yeah. And then I and then I was interviewing survivors as well. So it was almost a distinct project interviewing yeah. the, the show as survivors. Um, it enhanced my understanding yeah. of the book enormously um, in that although I did not take any survivor testimony whatsoever for the writing of those who save us mm -hmm. because those testimonies are hollowed ground, yeah. I could at least include in the novel the atmosphere yeah. in which survivors live. So it influenced it. Yeah. Very much That's so. Mm. Well, I think we're going to take a short break. Okay. Okay. And then we'll come back and we'll talk more about those who save us, Jenna right. Blum's book. Thanks. Thanks. Friends can provide the support you need to reduce your risk of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and stroke. Eat right and get active. Dude, I got my ball. How would you like to save your life from an ugly or reckless driving death? Act now by slowing down and we'll guarantee you complete satisfaction. Awesome! There is no spokesperson to prevent reckless driving. Speak up. Andy, slow down. <laughs> Once they've outgrown their toddler seat, they're still not ready for adult safety belts alone. Four foot nine is the magic number. Until then, kids need a booster seat. Make sure your little pumpkin gets there safely. Visit BoosterSeat.gov. And welcome back to the Brookdale Writers Series. I'm speaking with Jenna Blum, the author of Those Who Save Us. And Jenna, before the break, we were talking about um, just how much research you did for this book. Um, did you feel that that was important, that you really had to have read everything? 
Absolutely. In as much as that's possible when you're reading about the Holocaust, yeah. <laughs> I think that there is some quotation that I included in my query letter to my agent saying um, the amount that's been written about the Holocaust is more than could be read in a speed reader's lifetime, a young hmm. speed reader. But I don't think it's responsible to write um, historical fiction unless you are almost an expert in your field. I wouldn't mm -hmm. consider myself an expert, but I did try and read everything that I could get my hands on. And yeah. for that 10 years, pretty much on and off, I was immersing myself in, in Holocaust studies, oh. and I mean, which made me a really fun person to be with, as you can imagine. <laughs> now, in the, in the book, you, you go back and forth, in essence, between sort of the mother and the daughter, you know, the, the present and the past. Um, in the beginning, did you think this is going to be a story of their relationship? Did it evolve from them? The story actually evolved from the relationship between Anna, the German woman, mm -hmm. and the SS officer. That was what I wrote oh. first. So the daughter came later. The daughter did come later. Oh. I did know when I sat down to write the novel what shape it would have. Mm -hmm. Um, I knew... Uh, oh, you mean alternating between the present and I the past? I did know that I wanted to cut the present and the past together. Why? Because I think that war stories are so intense mm -hmm. that everything else that you put next to them kind of pales in comparison. And I think mm -hmm. even the, the veterans of... Um, World War II, for instance, will say that for the rest of their lives they feel as though something is missing, not mm. always even in a healthy way, but that, that time period was so intense that everything else seems a bit pale. Um, mm. And I did not want that to be the experience for the reader, going through the war with one heroine and then living in modern-day freezing Minnesota with mm -hmm. the other heroine. I felt that the daughter's story would also pale in comparison. So mm -hmm. I thought, well, I'm going to just sort of wrap them up together so if the reader wants to find out what happened to the mother, um, or to the daughter, love to read both stories together. <laughs> but that's not the way that the book was written. Yeah. I wrote all of Anna, the mother's story first, all oh. the Nazi Germany story that took me six months. And I wrote the daughter's story second, and that took me two and a half years. And I must wow. have gone through maybe 17 drafts of the daughter's now, story. Now, why was that so much longer and being <laughs> realized? <laughs> Trudy's story, the daughter's story, was a pain in the neck for me. She was my <laughs> problem child character. And I think the reason was that I knew what the mother had endured mm -hmm. during the war. So for the daughter's plot to consist of the daughter following the mother around saying, what did you do during the war? Um, yeah. made me feel like saying to her, you know what? She's never going to talk about it. She's a trauma survivor. Get over it. <laughs> um, so I tell my students, and I, I teach it at Boston University and for a great yeah. outfit in Boston called Grub Street Writers for adult writers, mm -hmm. and I have always told my students to write what you love as well as what you know, and often those two things are conjoined. Mm -hmm. um, I really had to get Trudy to a place where I loved her character, um, and that was it was really difficult. And finally, I just made her into a lonely professor and you know wrote about her students because I love teaching. I love my students. Yeah. Um, and I also gave her character a man because, you know, men are trouble and, <laughs> and I wanted to give her some conflict. Mm -hmm. And so I gave her plot um, some sort of organic outgrowths to her character yeah. while she was discovering the truth about her mother. Now she does interviews as well. Mm. Did, was that a later, a later addition that sort of opened up the character for you and how you could maybe negotiate kind of repeatedly asking the mother the same question mm -hmm. and kind of see her kind of evolve and start to understand herself? Or from the very beginning, did you think, yeah, that'll work, I'm gonna do that? Yeah, that was pretty much how it was. From the very yeah. beginning, I knew that the backbone of Trudy's story was going to consist of, of mm -hmm. survivor interviews. But initially, when I started writing her story, one of my many, many drafts mm -hmm. was that she was interviewing Jewish survivors, yeah. and that was my experience. So that was the natural outgrowth of my experience. But Trudy, imagines herself to be the daughter of an SS officer. And it w always mm -hmm. felt uncomfortable to me to have a character interviewing Jewish survivors and going into their homes under these false pretenses because, of course, mm -hmm. she wasn't showing up saying, hello, I am an SS officer's daughter. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until, however, maybe you know the 15th draft of the book that I suddenly had this brainstorm and thought, of course, she would be interviewing Germans as to how they feel about mm -hmm. the war. And I like that perspective better. Um, it seemed a fresher perspective to me in terms of what had not been explored in fiction. Mm -hmm. um, and it did give me the chance to look at a range of German reactions from, again, denial to shame to outright yeah. anti-Semitism to profiteerism. Um, and, and even in some cases for my German characters, a little bit of goodness. Mm. Uh, so the, 
interviews for Trudy are sort of a device on which the rest of her story hangs, but mm -hmm. she also has a character arc going from a lonely person to a person yeah. who has thawed a little bit through what she learns not only from the Germans she interviews, but f about her own mother. Yeah, yeah. I like that. that she kind of, she's a little, she moves towards happiness at the end a yeah. little bit. A, a little. little bit. She yeah. moves on the chessboard. She goes forward a square maybe. Yeah, but one it's square. Enough. It's enough. Yeah. It's a start, right? <laughs> yeah. um, The book really does seem to be about the ambiguities. You know, what is considered a guilty action? What is not? What's acceptable? What's not? You know, sort of that, the gray zone and how, how you can live and deal with having lived in that gray zone. And I know that, uh, you know, a large part of the book is about the relationship that Anna has with with this SS officer. And, um, you know, it, it's a, a sexually charged, um, you know, manipulative, violent sexual relationship. And I, I was wondering about that because it's, it's, it's a powerful element in, the, in the, the book. Was this something that you were worried about putting in? Something that you thought, is this gonna be too much? I mean, it's such a sensitive subject. It is a sensitive subject. I was worried about my mom reading it. Oh. Um, when she read the first draft of the book, I was sitting in the other room. I could hear her turning pages in the ring binder. Whoosh, whoosh, and then I heard her say, oh, my God, at one point. And I thought she was reading one of the more sexually graphic scenes. And mm -hmm. I said, what scene are you reading? And it turned out to be um, a scene in which a woman loses an eye, which is a oh, very yeah. emotionally and physically violent scene. Yeah. And when she was done, I said to her, what about the sex scenes? And she said, oh, we were doing all this stuff before you were even born. So that was <laughs> one worry out the window. Oh, good. I started with the relationship between Anna and the O, the Obersturmfuhrer, mm -hmm. as I, I had said, because it seems to me that Anna has a nasty trick played on her. She reacts physically mm -hmm. well to a man whose actions are monstrous, mm -hmm. and that is one of the reasons that she feels a calcifying shame for the rest of her life. Mm -hmm. And this is based on something that happened to me. Not that I'm a rape victim, I have to set the record straight. Yeah. Sometimes readers will write to me and say, I'm so sorry for what you went through. This is fiction. Yeah. But I did have the experience of dating somebody whom I thought was a big dork. Um, and otherwise, um, however, every time I saw him, my body is galloping toward him saying, yes, yes, yes. And my brain is moving away saying, no, no, no. And, <laughs> and I thought uh, this was also a gentleman who whose identity was predicated on the uniform he wore for his job. Mm -hmm. He was an airline pilot. And every time he was without his uniform, he looked really lost at sea. And mm. I thought, what would it be like? I've played the what if game, because that's what writers yeah. do. What would it be like if this poor German woman had this reaction, you know, her body betrays her with mm -hmm. this person on whom she's dependent for her life? Mm -hmm. What if his uniform is a different uniform? Um, mm. and, and she felt this compounded guilt and shame. So when I started working on the book, that was really where I was coming from, was taking an autobiographical experience and putting it in the basket yeah. of something that was much more dire. Yeah, well, it's interesting listening to you talk because you know, you've know you got your airline pilot and you know, you know, s s drinking schnapps with your mom as you drive around the German countryside. Um, you know, just how much of this seems to, to stem from experiences that you've been in or, or you know, have seen and experienced. Um, so it's interesting how autobiographical, I hate to say it, because the book is not you, of course, um, but the book seems to be. Do you find that, 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 that you pull a lot from your own life when you write? I do, and I think that one of the things that takes me so long with books is trying to find the right fictional basket to put my experiences in. With mm. this novel, the, my interest in the Holocaust or my obsession with the Holocaust even just happened to match up perfectly with this sort of off-the-cuff experience I'd had with this airline pilot. Mm. All of the pieces fit together yeah. so beautifully. And once I put him in a different uniform, the characters started walking and talking and moving around. And mm -hmm. it was almost as close as I can come to probably having a spiritual experience. I think of my writing that way, that oh. when the pieces are meant to fall into place, um, they do. Mm -hmm. Of course, they have to find you working. You have to keep limber and keep writing. But um, I do pull a lot from life. I think that it, the book is um, being revealed to be autobiographical in that way because you're asking good questions. A lot of times <laughs> what I tell people is that um, it's not autobi 
autobiographical in the sense that I'm not estranged from my mother as Trudy is from her mother, mm -hmm. that my mom is not German, um, I'm not a 50-something German history professor, <laughs> and I have been told that the book reads very much like memoir, so that when I yeah. speak at events or when I go to book clubs, which I do a lot, people are surprised to find that I'm not an 80-year-old German woman mm. or a 50-something German history professor. Yeah. Um, so in that sense, in the big building block sense, is the book is complete fiction. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of the fact, it's been really well researched. And in terms of the emotional things, well, I like to hope that they are all true. Yeah, well, I mean, I think it's a compliment to you. I mean, you've done your research. The book does feel incredibly real, you know, and true to that experience. It does. So you mentioned your, your writing process. Are you uh, in writing a lot? I mean, are you uh, I'm up at 5 a.m. every day to put in my my three hours before I, you know, go off and teach? Oh, sure. Yes, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really not. I would like to say I'm a lazy writer, but I, I don't think yeah. that's necessarily true. I think every writer has different patterns. And mm -hmm. one of the first pieces of advice I give my writing students is, if anybody tells you how to write, run in the other direction. <laughs> I do think that it's important to write every day in some form mm -hmm. um, to keep your muscles flexed. And that can include journaling or, I, as you can imagine, write very long narrative email to people. <laughs> Um, it's kind of the new form of journals. I suppose it is, yeah. <laughs> and that's actually sort of dismaying because once you send things, often they just disappear into the ozone mm -hmm. and then you don't have any record of what you were experiencing. Yeah. Unlike in the olden days when we wrote letters. <laughs> uh, but when I do write, when I am seized by an idea and that really mm -hmm. is how it feels, then I'm very obsessive about it. When I wrote This Who Save Us yeah. from start to finish, it took me three years. Mm -hmm. And I wrote um, from 10 in the morning, to 10 at night till 4 in the morning. Just wow. about every night. Um, and I was living alone then. Now I have a long-suffering live-in boyfriend in a black <laughs> lab. And um, they take up a little more of my time. But um, I was living alone. And for three years, I changed my clothes only to go teach. And mm. for the people at my local Starbucks, I thought, I just cannot wear this black shirt again because they're going <laughs> to know. Um, so I was really obsessive about it. And for me, it was a form of practical magic yeah. to have the characters seem so real to me that if I went and lay down after I was finished writing at 4 a.m. And one of mm. the characters said, that is not what I told you to say. That is not what I would say. I would have mm -hmm. to get up and go change okay. the piece of dialogue or change the sentence before I could get any piece. So that's kind of what it was like. That's great. Well, uh, unfortunately, we're running out of time. Um, but it has been such a pleasure talking to you. For me as well, and talking again, to you. The book is called Those Who Save Us. It is a wonderful book. It is a complex book. It is, is a book that should really be read. So thanks for coming by to thanks the show. Thanks for having me. The officer enters, on his trembling stops. She is too terrified to move. His decorations proclaim him to be of high rank, an Obersturmfuhrer, she thinks. And oddly, this Obersturmfuhrer seems to be alone. At least Anna hears no commotion outside, no desultory talk or laughter from where his SS brethren would be lounging against a car, waiting, perhaps smoking. The Obersturmfuhrer crosses the room. He is an enormous man, projecting an air of complete solidity except for a weakness of the jaw. His face disintegrates into his neck. He moves with purpose, but his gait is odd, almost mincing. Anna will later discover that this is because his feet are disproportionately small for his body, barely bigger than hers, sometimes causing him to trip over his own toes. He plants his gloved hands on the counter and leans forward. Do you always lock the door in the afternoon, Fräulein? He asks, hardly an astute business practice. Then he